And welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study here at Faith and Victory Church. So glad to have you tonight and trust you're having a wonderful week in the Lord. Um, to those of you who were able to join us for prayer last night, we had an amazing time, wonderful time in prayer last night. And um, so we, we are grateful for y'all joining us. And then tonight we're going to be um, doing our Bible study and uh, just excited about that. And don't forget me, join us this Sunday in person. Um, at 1230 at 6701 Ken Coy Road in um, actually a Jamestown address. Uh, it's New Life Family Church's facility. They're, they're permitting us to meet there on Sunday afternoons. And so we're grateful for that. So it's good to have a place to meet. And we'd love to see you there live and in person. Hallelujah. There's plenty of room if you're, if you're um, an adherent to the CDC COVID restrictions and you want to, you're concerned you might be too close to folks, very large sanctuary, lots of room to spread out. Um, and the CDC has reduced their recommended social distancing to three feet. <laughs> Hallelujah. And on Friday, the governor has lifted it to 50 people meeting in person. Uh, so glory. Hallelujah. All righty. Uh, we, we, we kind of finished up last week talking about confession and words and, um, the power of our confession. Um, but I want to kind of, um, launch off of that, not necessarily on that same theme, but launch off of that into, uh, maintaining a position of faith, maintaining the position of faith. Uh, first Timothy six twelve says, fight the good fight of faith, lay hold of on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Hallelujah. And so our fight of faith, we're professing a good profession, or right? confessing a good confession before. This means it's verbal, folks. If many witnesses are, are hearing your profession, then it's verbal. Amen. We speak our faith. We, we talk our faith. We talk words of faith. Hallelujah. Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. And finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand, um, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Um, the 20th century New Testament says, take therefore the full armor of God, when the evil day comes, you may be able to withstand the attack, and having fought to the end, stand uh, still, to stand your ground. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And having fought to the end, as still to stand your ground. Philip said, um, Therefore you must wear the whole armor of God, that you may be able to resist evil in the day of power. And that even when you have fought to a standstill, you may still stand your ground. The earlier version of Philip's before he... Um, when he called, he actually said, cleaned it up, uh, said, having uh, fought to a standstill, that you remain on the battlefield ready to do battle again. Hallelujah. <clears throat> I like the fact that we can make, maintain a position of faith, a position of readiness, a position that even in the midst of the battle, when we fight, and of course, we win. Hallelujah. Remember, whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And so we're to fight the good, good fight of faith. Amen. Hallelujah. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, mights, dominions, rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Hallelujah. We, we, uh, we fight that battle supernaturally by faith. Hallelujah. I want to read to you um, um, about some of our heroes of faith. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 11, we, we know this is the great faith chapter. And uh, Hebrews chapter 11, we start out in verse 7, and we, we read where it says, By faith Noah, 
being warned of God of things to, not yet as seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Something we've covered in our prayer time over the past few weeks is there are certain things that are going to happen in the earth that we can't stop from happening. The Antichrist will rise to power. There will be a one world government. I mean, you know, the, the, these things are biblically prophesied. They're, they're going to happen. You can't stop it. Um, if you could, Jesus would have done it when he was here. Um, but when we're warned of things, when we see things, we can still walk out our walk in faith and overcome, hallelujah, and live a life of victory. Praise God. The Bible says, by faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. He went out, not knowing whither he went. Boy, I tell you what, if we could ever understand the concept that God leads us and uh, directs us, and it's a step of faith, you're not going to have all the information when you're following God. I've got crickets going on right now. You're not going to have all the information when you're following God. He will show you, he'll start you in a direction. He'll show you things. He'll change and turn uh, you in different directions on this path and this journey until you get to where you're supposed to be. Um, <clears throat> you don't always know when these things are going on. I remember um, back in 19... Uh, 79 when I when I got born again and filled with the Holy Ghost um, I remember right after that just a, just two or three weeks later I just had this strong strong um, sense God didn't say it but I knew I was going to orient to preach now to be honest with you I thought I was leaving next week okay that's how strong it was and that's the way it is a lot of times. We get this sense of something. Now, I'm sure that when God told Abraham to get the out of that country, out of that father's house, away from that, you know, away from that father's family, and go into a place, I'm sorry, by no, hallelujah, uh, go into a place of that, so we'll show you, <laughs> hallelujah. Anybody got a steel brush? <laughs> My, yeah, there we go, hallelujah. Um, a place that I will show you, that he thought he was going to be there real soon. Now, we, from, we can tell it took a period of time before he got to where he was. I mean, he, he had to um, have his wife rescued from somebody who was going to take her for their wife and, you know, all this kind of stuff. And so it, didn't, it wasn't an overnight journey. Um, when, when the Lord impressed upon me that uh, I would go to the Orient and preach, I, I just kind of went, okay. Let's go right now. Let's load it up. Let's raise the money. Let's head to, let's head over there. And, um, and then time went by and time went by and time went by. Next year I enrolled in Rama Bible training center and went to Rama. Graduated from Rama. Um, had the call upon my life to go East young man. Primarily because there was a little filly waiting back east. Hallelujah. Sweetie. Yeah. Um, waiting on me to get out of school so we could get married. <coughs> and uh, She was in East Carolina at the time. We, I came home. We got married. And started our life together. And uh, man, thought I was, going to, I was going to go preach in the Orient. Still thought that. <coughs> and um, as time went on. Um, I didn't go into full-time ministry immediately. It was a number, it was, it was a number of five years uh, after graduating from Bible school that before I got a full-time ministry position, um, I worked in a, I worked in a restaurant that I had worked in prior to Rama and, um, you know, worked, served in the church and labored in the church. Um, went on a missions trip with the, um, um, with the, um, 
well, I actually went, on, went to a missions conference and was planning on heading to uh, Mexico City, Mexico as a missionary when the Lord arrested us and, and stopped us. Um, that's a whole other story. We could go into that one another day. And, um, and then after, um, you know, so, you know, five years later, I, I actually was on, went on staff at our church that we were in. And then about a year and a half later, I uh, started, com started commuting to Greensboro to interim pastor a church that after about five months, I actually took full time, which is where we still are today. And, um, took that church and began ministering, you know, being pastoring the church. And we were here, uh, for a couple, three years and a, um, another local pastor down in Ashboro called me and said that, look, Hey, you know, I got a guy named Mark Brzee coming in. Uh, have you ever heard of him? I said, Oh yeah, I remember brother Hagen talking about Mark Brzee and, um, I said, well, look, I got him coming in. He's going to do a Sunday morning with us. Um, and, a and a Sunday night, <clears throat> but he doesn't just want to do one church come in this area and do one church. He let do more church. I said, look, I'll take a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. That's back in the day, boy, you know, you, you, you were, if somebody showed up at your church to preach, you were excited to see them. Hallelujah. Cause nobody knew who you were. Nobody, you didn't know if they wanted to come to your church or not. You could call them and they said, oh, I'm not, I'm full or whatever. So, um, we had him come and over the next few years we had, he, he came, um, about every year, year and a half. And, you know, we developed a relationship. Well, one one day I'm at a uh, camp meeting out in Tulsa in 19, um, I believe 91, the 1991 camp meeting. And I'm uh, sitting in the assembly center. I look across. I happen to see him across there. And, you know, sometimes in a big meeting, like, you just kind of wave at somebody and go on about your business. And um, and when I did that, the Lord spoke and said, you're traveling Europe with Mark. And I thought, because he was doing all this stuff in Europe and all this, you know, he was, you know, he got kind of big name as big name preacher. Um, um, and, you know, speaking at Rama, speaking at camp meetings, speaking in, you know, our meetings and um, bringing East German pastors out of East Germany to America. They're getting people saved in East Germany. They've gone behind the Iron Curtain. All kinds of stuff is happening. And um, my first response to that was, yeah, right. Because I didn't really, I you know you think well, that's my ego, you know, that's some kind of inflated, whatever. Next day I was walking through the assembly center, uh, walked past him, patted him on the shoulder cause he was talking to him. I didn't want to interrupt him. Just kind of acknowledging. I was saying, Hey, he reached back and grabbed me and said, wait a second, I need to talk to you. And, uh, so I went and sat down kind of close. I let him finish his conversation. He came and said, look, I'm starting Bible schools in Europe next year. And we'd like for you to go minister in them. <laughs> like, wow. Okay, cool. You know, I, that was God yesterday. Yeah. Hey man, you know, it's always exciting when you think you heard something uh, and then you, you get confirmation. Hey, yeah, it really was God saying that to you. Um, and so that was in the summer in um, February of that next year. So 92, I flew to Tal um, Tallinn, Estonia and ministered there for a week and then flew to Fallen, Sweden and ministered there for a week. We were with Chuck and Sheila Banks in Estonia and then with uh, Tim and Vicki Kilstrom in Sweden. And uh, that was my first solo missions trip. Hallelujah. And uh, over the next few years, we, we, we traveled numerous places. Oh, I traveled and, the and actually a few times the family with me went with me. So we traveled to Estonia, to Sweden, <coughs> to England, to the Czech Republic, to uh, Spain, to France, to Italy. Um, ministering in Bible schools in all those countries, hallelujah, and uh, did return trips to Estonia. And um, I'm trying to think of any other countries I actually preached in the, you know, I did, I did travel in other countries, but, you know, I actually went in those countries and ministered. Huh? Germany. Germany. Yeah, left out Germany. That was, that was, oh, I knew it was one more. Germany. Uh, Deutschland. Hallelujah. And, um, you know, and then, uh, so over a period of five or six years, I went numerous times and ministered in these Bible schools and, um, came home one day and, um, got I opened up the mailbox to got Mark Bazzi's newsletter and was reading his newsletter. He's talking about how they had flown back from Europe, uh, East instead of going back West, you know, instead of flying back over the Atlantic, they went East and came over the Pacific. Don't know if the chip tickets were cheaper or they just, that's just the best flight they could get for that time. Uh, whatever. I don't know the reason. And they was there looking at the, the uh, world map that, you know, like in the back of the Sky Magazine, whatever they have in the, in the plane. And uh, he's looking at the world map and they're flying over 
uh, the Orient area at that time, the plane was over that area. Uh, the Lord said, the same thing you did in Europe will work, work in the Asia. And I'm reading the article. Now, folks, this is, 20, this is uh, 19 years after uh, the, Lord, the, the Lord impressed upon me. I was going to the, to the Orient, to Asia, to preach. And I'm reading that. And I'm, I've got a relationship, you know. I can go to any Bible school I want to go to at the time. And I'm about jumped out of my seat. I did. That's it. That's it. That's, that's the door. That's the door. And then um, February, again February. I don't know why I'll keep going over, over flying out in February. Um, of 1999. I touched down on the tarmac in Bangkok, Thailand in fulfillment of something God told me 20 years before. Now, I said all that. Now, that, this whole sermon can go a whole different way about being led by the Spirit. But I said all that so that you understand that you have to maintain a position of faith even when it doesn't look like what you thought was going to happen was going to happen. It starts looking like it'll never happen, you know, and your mind can start going, well, maybe I just missed that. You know, uh, I know that, that my heart is to go to the world and do things, but maybe that whole Asia thing was just kind of a whatever you, you, your mind will start doing that with you. But look, hold fast to God. Some things are a timing issue. Some things have to be worked out. Scenarios are worked out. God's working stuff out way, way in advance. Um, he knew that I would move to Greensboro. He knew I would make a connection with Mark Brzee. He knew that Mark would start Bible schools in Europe. He knew that Mark would hear him and say they would do it in Asia. And they did it and started doing it in Asia. Amen. And that weaved that whole thing, weaved into my life, <coughs> or my white life weaved into that. God knew all of that. Knew all that was going to happen. I didn't know all that was going to happen. I thought, well, uh, I'm going to raise money. I'm going to get on a plane. I'm flying to Asia. You know? And it just, and for a, for a good long time, that seemed like a distant, a distant thought. I was busy being an assistant pastor in church. I had started past then, then started pastoring a church, <coughs> then start traveling Europe, and so um, it seemed to be way back in the back. And just like that, suddenly, God brought it to the forefront. God brought it up. God brought it into realization. Hallelujah. Amen. So this walk of faith is going to be a journey where you don't know every turn and every twist and every this and every that. We do know the destination. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. <clears throat> and um, you just have to, <coughs> you have to stay faithful to God. Hallelujah. Um, so he went out not knowing whether he went. And, you know, listen, that, that, that kind of told enough of that story. That story has other veins I go in sometime. Um, but just to kind of show you that you got to walk out and keep walking your journey with God and walking it by faith, not knowing all the things that are going to happen along the way that are putting you. And let me say this. When Mark Brzee first came to our church, there was no way in the world I could have known that was the connection to get me to Asia. Because he didn't know it. He hadn't, he hadn't started doing Bible schools in Europe. He was a traveling itinerant teacher in America, primarily. And then started doing some things in Europe. And uh, then that Bible school thing got launched. And uh, boom, 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 boom. Um, you know, there's no way either one of us would have known in our initial connection that this was going to lead to the fulfillment of something God said in 1979. <coughs> 
Hallelujah. But it was. All that was connections that God made. Glory to God. Amen. Um, by, by faith, when he was called to go into a place, he should not, after receiving inheritance, bathe, he went out, not knowing whether he went. By faith, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob. Hallelujah. And of the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Now, let me say this. We cannot become consumed. Are you here? With the kingdoms of this world. We can't even become consumed with the kingdoms in this world that God is having us to build for him. We have to be looking to that city, to the great God and Savior. We have to keep our eyes fixated on him. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Whose builder and maker is God. Amen. Praise God. Through faith also Sarah received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang even one, him as good as dead, as so many as the stars of the sky in multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable. Now think about it. Now let's kind of take up here. That was my story a little bit. Abraham. God appears to Abraham at 90 and 9. I mean at, at, at 80, at 75 years old. It's 70 five years old when Abraham when Abram was 70 and five years old the Lord uh, appeared to him and said walk thou before me and be thou perfect hallelujah he said I am El Shaddai I'm the almighty God I am El Shaddai hallelujah and um, walk before me and be perfect and then he goes on and says uh, I'll make that season stand to the seashore and the stars of the heavens 75 now Sarah's 65 when God gives him this word Still don't see 65-year-old ladies walking around pregnant. There have been some older people that they did artificial insemination and, and put a baby in the womb, but they did not get pregnant naturally. Okay? You know, we don't have, there's not a lot of 75 and 65-year-olds having youngins. But God, but even at that point, they, she didn't have, they, she didn't bear seed. Um, 12 years after this event of God appearing and saying that, Sarah comes to Abraham and says, Abram, actually, it's still Abram, um, and goes, look, uh, the Lord must have shut up my womb. Go in with Hagar, my handmaiden, that you, maybe that you could see with her and uh, bring forth the child. And uh, the culture was that, you know, the handmaid belonged to her. She could offer her as a concubine to her husband. She did. Abraham didn't argue. Let me tell you something. Uh, when, when, you, when your wife gives you a man plan instead of a God plan, don't do it. We still paying the price for that uh, romp of the tent. Okay? We still got trouble because Abraham went into, went into Hagar in the tent. All right? We don't need any more Hagars bearing Ishmaels. You don't need Ishmaels in your life. We want Isaacs. <laughs> Can I get an amen from somebody? <laughs> Can I get a help me, Jesus? <laughs> oh, my. All right. And so, um, Eliezer is born. Glory to God. Now, Eliezer was a steward in his house. He, he said, Lord, you know, what, what, what are you going to do for me? He said, yeah, I go childless. And, um, you know, there's only one steward in my house, Eliezer. And uh, God reiterates it's going to be through his own seed. Hallelujah. Then, then, you know, Sarah offers him uh, uh, her handmaid. She bears a child in the name of Ishmael. And then later, God comes back when Adam's 90 and 9 years old. And he reiterates all of this again. And um, says, uh, you no longer shall you be called Abram, but you shall be called Abraham for the father of many nations I've made thee. As for thy wife Sarah, she shall bear. You know, and she's in another room laughing, not a not a laugh of joy, but a laugh of sarcasm. Ha! 
And then the Lord said, goes, why did your wife laugh? I didn't laugh. I didn't laugh. She, I didn't laugh. She knew she was in trouble. <clears throat> so we have, and, and then the year later, uh, this time next year, child was born. Isaac was born. Abraham was 100 years old. 25 years after God spoke to him and said, I'll make thee the sand of the seashore and the stars of the heaven. Isaac shows up. Hallelujah. Now, remember, Sarah had put out Hagar and, and Ishmael, put them out. And God said he'll bless them uh, for, because Abraham asked him to. But Isaac was the seed of promise. The seed of promise was brought forth 25 years after God spoke. 25 years. Isn't that wild? And we wait two, 25 days and we give up and quit. Ah, I thought I was in faith. You know, we don't know. We got to, we've got to learn to maintain a position of faith. Now, Abraham messed up in here. You know, he caved in. And God had to straighten them out. No, that's not the seed. We don't need to be, be, be trying to fix it for God. We just need to stay steady on course. Now, I'm going to say something. There's a saying um, that people make all the time. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. That is not necessarily true. Because if you remember the children of Israel marched around the walls of Jericho every day without saying a word. <clears throat> and then on the seventh day, God gave them a different direction, a different instruction and said, walk around it seven times. And on the seventh time, do this. You may be doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over again as an act of obedience of faith to God. And people are mocking you because you didn't get a different result. But in God's timing, he will deliver the promise. And you have to be faithful to his promise, to his word. Amen. So I, I reject that statement vehemently. Well, if you were in faith, this would have happened by now. Why don't you go talk to Abraham about that? How about those in the book of Hebrews, and we'll probably get to them, these having died in faith, having not received the promise that they without us could not be made perfect. Duh. Y'all here, you're gone home. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Do I get any enthusiastic responses out there on that one? Or did everybody disappear? Okay. Got a few out there. Jesse, did you do all of them? Oh, okay. Well, thank y'all. I'm not sure if Jesse's hitting them all just to make me feel good or if the rest of the crowds that are getting in there. Yeah. We make those statements because we start putting timetables and putting human interpretations and constraints on when things have to happen or we're not in faith. <clears throat> and a lot of that comes from pressure from the outside from others who are judging whether or not you're in faith. Well, if he was in faith, it would have happened by now. If he was really in faith, this would da-da-da-da. You know, they're not in faith. That's not faith because faith would da-da-da-da-da. You know, you know what you're talking about. You're immature and pretty much arrogant. to make those statements and to judge people that way. Hello? There are going to be things God tells you to do, leads you to do, has for you to do, that you're going to have to walk out by faith, but have a, there is a timetable, there is a time, a timing to it, 
that you can't speed up or slow down. Because certain events are going to take place to get you there. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. Whether you like it or not. And see, one of the mis misnomers or mischaracter mis misuses of confession and speaking things uh, in the care in our charismatic word of faith circles is we think we can just speak it and, and it's going to have to happen because we said it's going to have to happen right then. Did you notice Jesus said in Mark 11, 22, 23 and 24 when speaking, you know, remember Peter, uh, uh, Peter calling your members, but master behold the fig tree you cursed is withered away. And Jesus answered, saith unto them, have faith in God or have the God kind of faith. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that the things which he saith shall come to pass. He shall have whatsoever he saith. Therefore I say unto you, what things shall ye desire when ye pray? Believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. Now, the word shall is future tense. Ouch. Oh me. Help me, Jesus. Lord, straighten me out. He didn't say, believe that you receive them and you have them. You shall have them. There can be a timing involved. Hello? We know that when Jesus ministered to people, some people were healed instantly. Some people were healed as they went. Hello? Some circumstances, Bible healings in the Bible. He put clay in one guy's eye and said, go wash in the pool of Siloam and come again seeing. Events took place before he, he was healed. Hello? Are you here? You go home. But all that, we had to stay in faith during these periods of time. Quite frankly, if we were to speak it and it happened, it wouldn't take any faith to live. Hello? We just go around and go, I got, I got my Bible scripture today. Okay. I, I confess such and such. Boom. It might, it might. This isn't hocus pocus. Open sesame. Pour the genie out of the lamp. We walk by faith. And not by sight. So this position of faith that we must maintain is a walk, is a journey. Kind of coming up with a, 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 a little different tagline for our church, you know, um, the trek of faith on the uh, path to victory or something, something along that. I got, I got kind of stirring around on the inside of me. But, you know, the journey of faith, the trek of faith. And that's what it is. The life of victory is found in a trek or journey of faith. The rewards are found in the journey of faith. The answers are found in our journey of faith. The time that you believe that you receive and you having is called walking by faith and not by sight. Hallelujah. Uh, verse 13 of Hebrews 11, I just quoted this a little bit earlier. These all died in faith, having, not having received the promises, but having a seen, listen, <clears throat> I'm glad I read it because I would get more out of this. Having seen them afar off, were persuaded of them, embraced them, and confessed them, confessed, they were strangers and pilgrims in a strange land uh, on the earth. Look at that. They saw them, were persuaded of them, embraced them, and confessed they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Because <coughs> they had believed and received those promises. 
For they that say such things declare plainly they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of the country from whence forth, whence they came out, they would have opportunity to return. But now they desire better a country that is a heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. I can tell you that if you can't stand, you know, maintain your position of faith, the opportunity to go back to where you came from will arise. And it'll look way better. Hello, than where you're headed. I preached a sermon a few years ago called uh, Egypt Ain't All That. <laughs> Remember the children of Israel that got out? Moses went up the mountain. He just gone, few, you know, uh, 40 days. Dear Lord, 40, da 40 days. He comes back down out of the mountain and they've made a golden calf. They're worshiping and, and, and committing adulteries and fornications and all kinds of stuff in front of the calf. You know, would to God that we go back into Egypt? All this kind of stuff. I mean, they just, you know, Egypt, listen, and 40 days earlier, they were crying out, get us out of here. It's terrible. We've been in bondage 400 years. And they couldn't take 40 days in the wilderness and out there while Moses is in the mountain with God. They're ready to go back to the 400 years of bondage. Bless their hearts. You have opportunity to return. That's why Elisha was told to go, you know, basically burn your bridges. He went back and took the, the yoke and, and burned them and, and used it to sacrifice the oxen that he made his living with. And he came and followed after the, uh, Elijah. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac. And he that received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, this is Isaac, shall thy seed be. Accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence he received him in a figure. Now stop. God tells Abraham to go take Isaac, your son, your only son, go into a mount, offer him there to him as a sacrifice. Didn't tell him he would raise him from the dead. Didn't tell him he was going to, have to, he was going to be able to bring him back. He said, you go offer him up. But God, Abraham had a word from God that in Isaac shall thy seed be. And so as he gets to a certain place and he tells the servants, y'all stay here, I and the lad shall go yonder and worship the Lord and return again unto thee. He's planning on bringing Isaac back because he had a word that said in Isaac shall thy seed be. And in order for God to fulfill that promise, if he offers him on that sacrifice, he's going to have to raise him up out of the ashes and raise him from the dead. And that's where Abraham's faith was. Glory to God. By faith, Isaac, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was a dying, blessed both the sons of Joseph and worshiped leaning upon the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph, when he died, made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. Now, see, here, here he dies in faith. Joseph does. Not going back to the promised land. But when you leave, you're going. I know you're going. Take my bones with you. Hallelujah. By faith, Moses, when he was born, uh, was hid three months of his parents because they saw he was a proper child. And they were not afraid of the king's commandment. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he hath respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Hallelujah. Through faith he kept the Passover, the sprinkling of blood, lest he destroyed the firstborn should uh, he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. By faith, they passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. When the Egyptians essayed to do so, they were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell down 
after they were compassed about seven days. Remember six days? They walked around it, didn't say a word. Can you imagine about day four? This is one reason they weren't allowed to say anything. Guys, I think they missed it. I mean, why don't they let us fight? They don't know their head from a hole in the ground. I mean, they're just stupid. We went, we went out day one and walked around the wall. Okay, couldn't say anything. Day two, couldn't say anything. Day three, couldn't say anything. Here we are, day four, got to walk around that wall and do nothing. And they all sit up on the wall looking at us like, what is wrong with them? Day five, day six, they get up the next day. Okay, guys, we're going to march around the wall seven times. Can't say anything. Here we go. They don't make it up for lost time. One time, two time, three time, four time, five time, six time, <clears throat> on the seventh time. Shout, make a loud noise, you know, uh, rejoice before the Lord, whatever, and, and the walls fell down. They went around that thing 13 times and nothing happened. Did the same thing over and over and over again and didn't get a different result. I guess according to people, they were insane. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Okay, somebody, okay, I got enthusiastic people out there. Okay, thank you. But on the seventh time of the seventh day, they fell. <coughs> because God gave them further instruction. And when you're walking by faith, you may be doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. Um, people have asked me, because, you know, listen, we've been teaching the same thing, preaching the same thing, doing the same thing for all these years in Greensboro, and our church is not big. Other people come in town, get big churches, you know. Um, I can't answer for any of that. But the God who said go hasn't told me to do anything different. Now, I'm well assured because he said he was going to bring us into some things. I saw some things in a vision uh, a number of years ago that when he gives command and says, do this this way now, that things are going to break forth. And there's, and this, I'm not against any of this, but let me say something. There is no church con growth conference. There is no leadership conference. There is no any kind of conference that can substitute for being faithful to God, doing what he told you, and then following his instructions in his timing for certain things. All those things are good, but I am telling you that you cannot follow somebody else's plan if God has told you to do something a certain way. And we'll run off to this and go, oh, and if we did this, we'll be, we'll be this size in six months. Hello? And I've tried some, I tried doing some of that stuff. You know, we, you know we're going to do, right, yeah, we're doing this, we're doing this. And you're like, I, I remember a number of years ago, we were, um, we were wanting to, to get into a permanent building and um, we were going to raise money. You know, we, we put out the church, listen, you know, this is the year we need to raise money. I, and I did that more than once over the years. We couldn't raise 50 cents. I'm not joking. I, I, I was a little, that's a little <laughs> understated. But we didn't raise anything. $200 or $300 or whatever. <clears throat> Couldn't get, just couldn't do it. Wouldn't, it wouldn't come in. Last summer, we got people say, you know, here's an opportunity. We, we did have a building we were looking at. God did not go say buy the building. He did not. We just thought it was a good idea. Now, we were, we were impressed that it's time to start moving, okay? And we found a place. Well, this, this will work. We can make this work. Now, I'm going to say, it was not ideal. But it would work. You understand what I'm saying? 
Yeah, this wasn't the perfect scenario, but this will work. We can make this work. Hallelujah. And so we, we, we started raising money. It didn't come in real, real fast. I mean, it started coming in. I, initially, we got a good chunk of people, you know, out, other ministries, other people we knew started sending money to the church. We, we you know, building fund. We, and it built up over a few months to about $20,000. Um, and, um, you know, got it up over 20, got it 21, 22. And then uh, and all of a sudden, we get a gift to the church, we, the largest we've ever had. It shoots up to the 65000 we needed for a down payment. And by the time we got the money, the building sold. I mean, it sat there all that time. And of course, first thing you're going to go is, we missed it. We should have tried to do it before now. <clears throat> no, we're moving. God's moving us in a direction. And so we're starting, you know, all the times I tried to raise money, we couldn't raise. I mean, you know, like Brother Hagin said, that guy used to pray, oh, Lord, move by some hook or crook. We tried every hook and crook in some way and somehow to get money to come in. We couldn't do it. We even thought about barbecuing and, I mean, uh, offering chickens up on the altar of building fund. <clears throat> Having a chicken bone cemetery uh, to build the church on top of. Selling chicken. I'm, I'm, cook, you know, I'm, I'm being silly now. Hallelujah. Um, but I do know this. Now God's moving us. We're in a position we've never been in as a church with a position to be able to go do something and have money on hand that as the opportunity presents itself. We don't have to go, oh, we got to go raise money. <clears throat> no, we got the money. Now we're just going to build it. Hallelujah. It's a different step. But we're in a different place now. So God's adjusting stuff. And we've been doing the same thing all these years. It's amazing when God's timing hits something. I remember when we bought the house we're in now. Um, we, um, we, we had kind of started outgrowing our former house and thought, you yeah. know, and I, I'm going to close with this one. We, we'll finish up some of this next week. Um, we had um, started out growing our other house. The kids were getting bigger. We had two bedrooms. We had three bedrooms, the master and two bedrooms. The girls were getting bigger. Of course, Nathan had his own room. And they, did, they didn't fit in one room anymore. And really weren't going to fit as they got bigger, older. I mean, they were, oh, I don't know, Jesse was about sixth grade by then, seventh grade, somewhere in that neighborhood. And, um, well, 1999, whenever that was. No, this is 1997, 98, that seven. We're trying to sell the house seven. And um, so we put our house somewhere. We, we made an offer uh, uh, with a, a, a builder. <coughs> they were building a home for us based on a contingency. Um, and so, you know, they're building a home, and we're trying to sell our house. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You're, if you all remember the old cone of silence in Get Smart, it came down. Well, there was a super enlarged one that came down over that house. You name it, and we couldn't get people to come in there to try to buy it. Now, the closer that we got to this house being built, it, was a 90, it only took them 90 days. They were, they were what they called um, package homes. In other words, they built, they built the walls in a, in a, in a um, you know, warehouse, sent it out, and then stood them up and tied them together and all that kind of stuff. It was stick built, but it was built in sections, uh, and then they put the siding in the end, you know, did it, you know, during that, it, it just made the process faster and cheaper. And, um, you know, they're getting our house and it's getting, it's moving along. I mean, it's getting, it's getting on up there close and, um, moving. I mean, and we went to Europe and came back and they, they had changed some things on the house. Um, but I'm telling you, <clears throat> our realtor would say, pastor, we got, you know, you know, they, they, we, open houses don't really work, but we were having open houses. She was saying, you know, um, people, you know, we did Jericho. I went outside with oil. We marched around the house. We called it sold, you know, in Jesus name. I mean, we bound every lion devil on the planet that was keeping our house from selling and our buyer was coming in Jesus name. We did it all. And believe what we were saying. And we couldn't get anybody in there. 
went to Europe, came back. They had changed some stuff on the house we were building, and we we backed out of the contract. They just they messed it up, and um, you know, well, so you know, you had soldiers by now. We'll still sell it to you. No, I'm done. We're done. You ruined it. And so we went back to our other house and uh, said, well, we'll just stay here. So we put in some, we put in new carpet and we put in a new vinyl, um, updated painting and stuff like that. And just going to stay there. A year later, Janie's looking, finds the house that we're in right now. Says, I like that. So we, we came over and looked at it. And guess what? That's where we are today. See, yeah, getting a new home was it. But God, and this home was, this home was way better than the other one we were building. Way better. Has more room, uh, better lot, um, better. Uh, a neighborhood that, that is, had more amenities. Let's put it like that. This, our neighborhood has a pool, has a tennis courts, has a playground. The other one didn't have anything. There was, there was nothing. There was no amenities to the neighborhood. Um, houses were, were some smaller lots, um, you know, more parking on the street, you know, not, not in the driveway. So it was a, you know, you drive through and you had to dodge cars just to get around. And, you know, all, we were happy. We were going to be happy living there, but um, God had a better plan. And you, and then selling that house that time was as easy it's making a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. We had a sign out front, and, you know, we had a little tube in it with all the information, and it was empty. And looked out the window one day, uh, and um, there's a girl sitting in her minivan looking at the house, just sitting in it. And I run out there. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an aggressive homeowner seller. I said, hi, are you, are you looking at it? She said, yeah, I love this house. I've ridden by this house so many times over the, over the years thinking how much I would love to live in that house. I just love that house. She was from Eastern Carolina. We had the wraparound farmhouse front porch. She loved the porch. She had dreamed of having that house. <laughs> Hallelujah. I said, if you wait right here, I'll go in and get you some information. Ran in the house, pulled up the file, printed it real quick, came back out and gave it to her. And she, her and her, her, and her husband, the one that bought the house. Hallelujah. Yeah. It didn't, it didn't take any time. Once we made an offer on this one, it didn't take any time to sell our other one. It's like boom, boom. There are things in the timing of God that we just have to walk out. Hello. And know this. If you're pressing in a direction and it's not working, back up and ask the Lord what's going on. Am I, am I pushing this too far in the wrong direction? Amen. So that I can stay in faith and stay, and stay a winner. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, I'm going to kind of close there. Um, I want to thank all of y'all for joining us tonight. Was it, oh, it's after 8 o'clock. Sorry, I went past. Um, did y'all get anything out of that out there? Can I, can I, can I get some, I got something out of it, you know, little happy clappies. Um, praise the Lord. Y'all leave us. <laughs> Are they still out there, Jesse? Okay. Oh yeah, there, here we go. There we go. <laughs> Woo! Glory, glory, glory. Thank you. All right. Praise the Lord. Um, we sure love you. And don't forget Sunday. Be with us on Sunday if possible. Love to see you in person. Those we haven't seen, some of you we haven't seen in a year and, or over a year. We would like to see you. Praise God. We would love to, love to have you with us. I mean, we appreciate you joining us online. We appreciate you tithing and sending money to the church. But we'd like to see you in person. Um, you know, praise God. We're, we're a virus kill zone. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Listen, Janie and I love you. We bless you. We thank God for you. And want to remind you of these words of 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. And whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. God bless you. See you next time here, Faith and Victory Church, online.